Welcome to Steps to Life. Ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? I want to speak to you today about something that has troubled many, many Christians. A number of years ago, before my daughter was born, my wife and I were attending uh, in the Sabbath afternoon, we were attending a revival service in a Seventh-day Adventist church. It was a conference church on the West Coast. And there was a well-known uh, if I told you who it was, you'd all know who it is. A well-known Adventist preacher who was preaching on the subject of Christian perfection. And he showed very clearly, gave very strong evidence from inspired writings that you had to be perfect to be saved. You had to be living a sinless life and be perfect to be saved. And... Uh, <clears throat> After that meeting, my wife and I, we were visiting in the home of a professional man that lived in that area, and uh, he had other visitors, Seventh-day Adventists, in his home, and uh, they got to talking about this. And this man's wife said, gives me a headache. Let me explain why she had a headache. She didn't know how she's ever going to be in that kind of condition. 
And so the, the topic of Christian perfection is not a popular topic in our society today. It was a much more popular topic in the 19th century when there were many people who believed that we were getting better and better. And it was during that period of time that some Protestant preachers developed an idea of Christian perfection where they taught people that if you come to the Lord and give your life to Him, you'll be perfect right then, that day. If you read Ellen White's writing, she talks a lot about this and said that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say you just come to the Lord and you're perfect that day. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't teach that. Read 2 Peter 1. Well then, what about it? And why are people discouraged about it? Well, I want to bring you some good news. I'm going to show you some things that the Bible says about Christian perfection, but then I'm going to show you that you don't need to be discouraged about it because I'm going to show you how you can have it, how you can get it. Before we open God's Word and read it, let's pray that the Lord will help us understand what we read. Father in heaven, we come to you humbly recognizing that we will never be perfect unless you work a miracle in, inside of each one of us. And we pray to you and we pray that you'll help us to understand what you want to do in us. And help us to know how to cooperate with you so that this miracle may happen in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> When I was about 19 years old, I was reading in the book Great Controversy toward the end of the book, and she was talking about how wonderful it was going to be to live in heaven with those who had perfected Christian character in this world. And the thought came to my mind, well, what about the Christians that haven't perfected Christian character? What about them? Well, you won't be associated with them because they won't be there. Let me read to you a few statements. First of all, this is a, one of my favorite devotional books called This Day with God. This uh, book was published oh, a number of years ago. It was published in 1979. Let me read just a couple of sentences. Here's one. Here's just a short one from page 32. It says, God requires moral perfection in all. What does God require? He requires moral perfection. And then here's one from page 90. Just one sentence, two sentences. This probationary life is given to bring man back to this perfection, which is to be the character of all who shall be saved. The law of God is a reflection of his character. So, all who are saved will be perfect in character. Now, we're living in a time when there are a lot of people, including Protestant preachers, who have challenged this concept. And uh, Adventists have been challenged with this concept. And we even have Adventist preachers that, that say, well, no, that's not biblical. We just believe that you're just saved by grace. So, so that nobody will be confused, let's just read just a few texts from the Bible. We could spend most of the time reading texts from the Bible that say this very same thing. But we'll just read a few. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. I promised you I'd only read a few, so we'll have to be true to that and just read a few. 1 Corinthians 1, it says, verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say they were going to be in the day of, of Christ? They were going to be blameless. Now Paul repeats this over and over again in his epistles. For instance, look in Philippians, the first chapter and the 10th verse. It says that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's Philippians 1. 10. We could go just about any book in the New Testament. Uh, look in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. 
It says, verses 22 and 23, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made what? Perfect. Like I say, there's many other scriptures that we could read. We could read from 2 Peter 1. We could read from James we could read from the book of Revelation. We could read from the book of Matthew. We could read from the Gospel of John. We could read from the book of Romans. We could read all over the New Testament about this subject. The New Testament teaches. The book of Revelation says clearly the only people that will be saved are those that are overcomers. So, like I said, when you start to talk about this, especially in our day and age, we're living in a, in a time of uh, pessimism. We don't have the optimism that the world had in the 19th century. And so when you talk about this, people get discouraged and they say, well, I guess I'll never make it. You ever heard somebody say that? Once I was preaching down in the state of Florida and a couple of people, a man and a woman, came up to talk to me after the sermon, after the service was over. They were angry. And they told me that what I just preached about, that if they had to do that, they would never get it done until the Lord came. So they were lost. And I, of course, I was the fault of them being lost, is what I preached about. And I had to tell people, I've had to tell people, well, you know, I, I didn't make the rules. I'm just telling you what the Lord said, but I didn't make the rules. And so we're living in a time whenever you talk about Christian perfection, it's not like it was in the 19th century when people were optimistic and they thought the world's getting better. The 20th century was so bloody and so filled with terrorism and war and strife that it sort of calmed, it sort of reversed all those optimistic notions that society had in the 19th century. People don't feel so optimistic, they feel pessimistic, and people are more apt to say today, well, I'm not perfect now, and I never will be, and I'm stuck then. But there is a way. For the person in this room that is the weakest and the most sinful, there is a way that you can be perfect. And we're going to study that now. We're not going to spend time, a lot of time, studying about the doctrine of perfection itself, although we could look many, many texts in the Old and New Testament. We could read many spirit of prophecy statements about it. But we're not going to focus on perfection itself and what it is. We're going to focus on how. Would you like to know how? How can this be my experience? How can this happen? And people have trouble overcoming their evil habits. Have you noticed that? And like Mark Twain said one time, he said, it's not hard to overcome smoking. It's not hard to quit smoking. I've quit a thousand times. Well, what, did he, what does that mean? That means he started smoking again about a thousand times after he quit. And so, people try to do things, and they find that what they try to do, they can't do. The person says, I'm not going to lose my temper anymore. And by afternoon, something's happened that before they realize it, they just flew off the handle. And then they said, oh, I did it again. And like my brother used to say, by the time a person is middle-aged, there might be some sins that they have committed tens of thousands of times and they can do it without even thinking and then afterward they oh, I did it again. How am I going to deal with a situation like that? Well, we're going to see how. And we're going to see how from the Bible. And it's so simple that somebody here is going to think that, oh, it can't be that simple. But it is. It is so simple that you wouldn't believe it, except God said it. And because God said it's this simple, this is how simple it is. So turn in your Bible to the book of Isaiah, and we're going to see how you can be perfect. 
And how, we're going to start studying how this happens. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 22. It says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Well, somebody says, Pastor John, you're out of your mind. If you knew how bad a fight I'm having with my evil habits, you would know it's not that simple. But I just read to you, according to the Bible, it is that simple. And we read in our scripture today about an experience that the children of Israel had. You remember in the wilderness, they got to complaining. And so the Lord sent fiery serpents among them. They started dying off from these the bites. Ellen White, by the way, says that these fiery serpents dwelt in the wilderness. They were there all the time. But the Lord had miraculously preserved them from being bitten. But when they started complaining, God withdrew his protection. And these fiery serpents started biting them, and they started dying. I've often wondered, I have a curious, curious mind. I've often wondered, when I, when I read that story, I thought, well, what kind of serpents were those? There are two main kinds of venom that poisonous serpents inject into their prey or into human beings. One is the kind of venom that the rattlesnake or the copperhead or the cottonmouth or water moccasin, those are all what we call pit vipers, and they inject a poison into you that affects your circulatory system. And if the bigger the snake is, the more poison the snake develops that it can inject in you, and so if you get a bite from a big rattlesnake, or if it's just a child, even a small one, you can die because of heart failure. Your heart stops. So it's a poison that affects the circulatory system and causes the heart to quit. And so I knew of a little girl that wandered out on the edge of their lawn, and uh, she came back home and said, Mommy, I got, I got a bite. She looked, there's two marks. It looks like two, two needles went right in. They suspected right. They got her right away to the hospital. She had been bitten by a rattlesnake. She got out by the edge of the lawn. And uh, a rattlesnake bite is dangerous, especially if it's a large snake or if it's a child. You can die in a short time. But there is another kind of bite that is even more dangerous than the rattlesnake bite. Now, I don't know for sure, but as I've analyzed this story and read what Ellen White says happened to the people, the symptoms that they were having when they got these snake bites, I have suspected that it was a snake bite that is similar to what we call an asp, or the most well-known snake in this category is the cobra. In the United States, the only snake that we have in this category that makes this kind of a toxin is the coral snake. And this is a toxin that goes, is poison to the central nervous system. And if you get bitten by a king cobra, you can be dead in 30 minutes. It's quicker than with a rattlesnake. And because it's a very deadly neurotoxin. If you get bit by a king cobra, you have to get antitoxin in your body immediately or you're not going to make it. And the children of Israel were bitten by these venomous snakes. I believe that they were probably snakes that produced a neurotoxin like a cobra or an asp. There are a number of snakes that do this, by the way, in the Orient. Uh, one of the most deadly one is called a crate. One time when we were missionaries in Burma, my father was working, my father was the administrator of a mission hospital for the Adventist Church in Burma, or Myanmar today, in the city of, they call it Rangoon then, they call it Yang, it starts with the Y, they changed the name, like they've changed the name of everything over there. Uh, Yangon, something like that. Uh, now it's the capital city. And the Adventists had a mission hospital there. Later it was taken over by the communists. And my father was up, they had a, they had a warehouse, of course, there. They had a lot, and my father was up there doing some work, he didn't know later. He had been with just probably just a few inches 
from a crate. He could have been killed, just could have been dead before he got out, out of that place, but the Lord preserved his life. They, they found the snake later, and it, it hadn't bitten him. He, he just left him alone. And so the Lord preserved his life. The Lord preserved the lives of the Israelites until they started complaining. And when they started complaining, God withdrew his protection. And it says that many of these the Israelites were bitten by the snakes, and they began dying. Now, friend, this has a spiritual lesson because you and I have been bitten by a snake. He's called that ancient serpent, called the devil and Satan. He's bitten us. We are infected with a lethal disease that's called sin. And when I say sin, it's not just guilt, but we have the power of sin inside of us. Paul talks about this in Romans 7. He says, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do do. You ever read that in Romans 7? Well, why is that? It's because of the sin that's inside. And so because of the sin that's inside, he wants to do what's right, but he doesn't. He doesn't want to do what's wrong, but he does. He's been stung, see? When the devil succeeded in causing the fall of our first parents, he caused a fall so that everyone, all of their descendants, have inherited what we call a sinful nature, or the Apostle Paul just calls it the flesh in Romans 7. And we try to escape, but we can't. We're stuck. It's like when you've been bit. And so Moses prayed because there were people dying all around. And the Lord said, make a brass serpent, hang it up, and tell the children of Israel, when anybody's bitten by a snake, he's to look at that. Ellen White has some very interesting things to say about that. She says that there were some people that were bitten by the serpents, and they told them there's a serpent, Moses put up a serpent, and you're to look at it. She says that there were some people that said, what good is it going to do to look at a, a serpent, a brass serpent? What good is that going to do? And she says they died because they wouldn't look. But everybody that looked, even if their eyes were becoming glazed over, if they would look at it, immediately, A miracle took place. Now, Jesus told Nicodemus that that was to teach us something. Turn in your Bible to John 3 and look at what Jesus said about it. John 3. Verses 14 to 16. Notice, to look... If you would look, that meant that you believed that God was going to do something. If you wouldn't look, that meant you, would, you didn't believe that God was going to do anything. You see, looking means that you believe. You believe God's going to do something. Notice here, John 3, 14 to 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Nicodemus did not know what Jesus was talking about. This sermon was given to just one person. We don't have any record that Jesus ever said this to His disciples or anybody else. He just told one person. Ellen White says that Nicodemus later, Nicodemus told John the Beloved this story, and John wrote it in his gospel. This sermon was given to just one person who was a spiritual leader of Israel, and he didn't understand it. Nobody understood it. And nobody even knew about it except Nicodemus. But the time came when Nicodemus came. He hadn't been called to the Sanhedrin. They had condemned Jesus to crucify him without even calling him, even though he was a member, because they knew he would object. He and John Joseph of Arimathea hadn't been called. But he found out what was going on in the morning, and he went, and it was too late to stop it. There wasn't anything he could do to stop it. And he went. 
and he saw. He saw Jesus crucified. So I put up on the cross. He saw him hanging there, and he saw everybody mocking him. And as he was watching, all of a sudden, the story Jesus told him came back to him. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, in the same way, the Son of Man has to be lifted up so that anybody that believes on him won't perish. How did you save your life when the serpent was left lifted in the wilderness? You just looked. That meant that you believed that God was going to work a miracle to keep you from dying from the snake bite. So how is a person saved? He's saved by looking. What does the look imply? It implies that you believe. You're looking because you're expecting that God is going to work a miracle in your life. Now, if you look, by the way, when it says to look, it doesn't mean when you to look to Jesus uplifted on the cross as Moses uplifted the serpent in the wilderness. It's not talking about just looking and then walking away. I'm not talking about that. It's talking about looking and looking some more and to keep on looking. Did you know that that's how a person becomes perfect? Let's read that. First of all, let me read you an interesting statement about that from this same book, this morning watchbook that I like so much. I like this so much, I, I don't know how many times I've read it. I'm reading it over and over again. I thought I liked Upward Look better than any other morning watch book that I had read, but I think I like this one just as much. This is from page 96 in this book. This is written, by the way, to... This is a letter that was written to... Uh, Elder F.C. Gilbert. Elder F.C. Gilbert was a leading Adventist minister. He was a Jew who became a Seventh-day Adventist minister, and he ministered to the Jewish people all of his life. He's a very brilliant man, by the way. She's writing him a letter, and this is what she says. I feel very sad as I think of how few there are who show that they have tasted the deep blessedness of communion with a risen, ascended Savior. Men of the world are striving for the supremacy. God's followers are to keep Christ ever in view. Did you get that sentence? We're to keep Christ what? Ever in view. Inquiring, is this the way of the Lord? A holy desire to live the life of Christ is to fill our hearts. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Oh, that our people could realize what advantages would be theirs if they would look constantly to Jesus. What would happen if you look constantly to Jesus? She says there's going to be advantages. You don't even know what advantages there are going to be. Well, what are the advantages? Let me read on. She quotes now 2 Corinthians 3.18. You might not go that text up in your Bible. 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What happens as a person keeps looking? What did we read in 2 Corinthians 3.18? What happens? You're changed. Uh, do you need to be changed? I need to be changed. How am I going to be changed? Well, if I keep looking, you are changed into the image of what you look at all the time. Maybe we should stop there for just a minute for you to think that through. What are you looking at in your life? I come in contact with people and... 
the children in their family are, what they're looking at is video games, and the kind of video games they're playing is they're killing one another. The son of a, in a Seventh-day Adventist family, now this person has graduated from college already, came to his mother just a short time ago and said, He decided he was going to go to the military, Seventh Avenue's family. He said, he said I'm, I'm going to bear arms. He said, it doesn't bother me to kill, it won't bother me to kill somebody. Well, why will it not bother him to kill somebody? Because his favorite pastime is playing video games. On these video games, he's killing people all the time. Now, he's never killed anybody yet. But he's killed so many people on these video games that he says it wouldn't bother him to kill somebody. What's happened? He has been changed into the image of Satan by, what, by doing that because the Bible says that the devil is a murderer from the beginning. That's what Jesus said. The devil is a murderer. He's a liar and a murderer. He was that way ever since the beginning. And if you're watching lying and murdering, you're going to be changed into that image. You're, you're changed into the image of what you behold. What are you looking at? What kind of video are you looking at? What kind of magazines are you reading? What, what kind of internet pictures are you looking at? What are you looking at? Now, you don't have to answer to me, but you need to think about it because you're going to answer to the Lord someday what you're looking at. What you're looking at is going to change you. Now, if you are looking to Jesus, do you know what's going to happen? You're going to be changed so that you become like Him. By the way, is Jesus perfect? What's the way for you to become perfect? The way for you to become perfect is to keep looking to Him. Keep looking at Him. And if you keep looking, you're going to be changed into the same image of what you look at. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. She says, she just quoted 2 Corinthians 3.18. This is page 96 in the book, This Day with God. She says, he is our Alpha and our Omega, pressing close to his side and holding communion with him. We become like him. Through the transforming power of the Spirit of Christ, we are changed in heart and life. His words are engraven on the tablets of the soul, and we are His witnesses representing Him in the daily life. So, what happens? What will happen if I keep looking to Jesus? I'll be changed. How will I be changed? I will be changed into the same image. I will become like Him. And remember, Jesus is perfect. If you're changed into His image, you'll be perfect too. But you need to keep watching. Have you been watching long enough so that changes are taking place in your life? I want to talk for just a few minutes about the results of looking to Jesus, not in just a general way, but in, in more specific way. And you can find words to this effect in this little book, Education, page 257, 258, especially page 257. What would be the result of looking to Jesus? Number one, Every deficiency of character will be supplied. Do you have any deficiencies of character? Would you like those deficiencies of character to be made up so that you don't have deficiencies of character anymore? 
every, Ellen White says, every deficiency of character can be supplied. So you don't have any deficiency anymore. Wouldn't that be wonderful? That's a result of looking to Jesus. Now, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. There's a theology that's abroad in Adventism today that says that all you need to do is just sit and watch and then just be passive and then everything will happen. No, that's not what we're talking about. You have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Let's read that in the Bible. You have to cooperate. You have to be active. Philippians, the second chapter. Verse, verse 13 first. It says, It is God who works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's verse 13. Some people read that and they say, Okay, that's it. All I have to do, I'll just look and God will do it and I won't have to do anything. Wait a minute, Paul said, That's not what I had in mind. Look what he says in the verse just before that, verse 12. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. He says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that's working in you. You have to cooperate with what God is doing. Let's try to make that real practical. It doesn't do any good to talk unless we understand it in a practical sense. So let's, we need an example. For many people, the character deficiency they have is impatience. For other people, the character deficiency that they have is anger. For some people, the character deficiency that they're working on is lust, sexual lust or some other kind of lust ambition to be wealthy or have be famous or something in this world. For other people, the character deficiency that they're working on is appetite. Let's take appetite. Appetite is so basic that Ellen White says that if you gain the victory in appetite, you can gain the victory in everything else. And if you don't gain the victory in appetite, you won't be able to gain the victory in everything else. So let's suppose that the character deficiency that a person's dealing with is their appetite. I knew a lady one time, she was a Bible worker, she trained me to how to give Bible studies. She was probably oh, 70 or 75 years old, I was about 19 or 20. She, was, she trained me to give Bible studies and one day we were talking and she said, she said, when I was 15 years old, now she was an Adventist, she'd been an Adventist I think most of all of her life. She said, when I was 15 years old, I thought that if I could overcome eating between meals, I'd be ready for translation. She had a terrible battle. And this is a real battle for somebody, but it was for her. She said when she was 15, she says she was, she was so upset with this, she thought if she could just get the victory over that one thing, if she could just stop eating between meals, she'd be, she thought she'd be ready to go to heaven. Now let's think this through. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let me ask you this question. Who is it that in a situation like that, that actually stops eating between meals? Is it the Lord in the, in the 40 days of fasting in the wilderness? Is it Him or is it you? Who is it that stops doing it? You, me. Now, if I'm going to stop doing it, I'm going to have to actually make a decision and follow through and refuse to partake of food in between meals. By the way, just for you that are children and haven't ever studied physiology very much, let, let me just mention to you that eating between meals is a very dangerous practice. It can end up giving you stomach trouble later in life. We won't go into physiology now, but you can talk to your parents about that. They can tell you. Eating between meals is a very dangerous practice. And it is part of religion, not to just be eating all times of the day. That's for cows and horses. They're different. They don't have a brain like you have. The more intelligent 
for the children that are thinking this through, <clears throat> the more intelligent you want to be as an adult, the more critical it is that your eating is strictly controlled because eating has everything to do with the development of the brain and, and intelligence, especially if you want to be very intelligent. That's something you can talk to your parents about. They can tell you. But how, if a person has, doesn't have enough willpower to stop and they just keep, and they've got this habit, you mean they've eaten between meals maybe thousands of times already, how are they going to stop? Well, let's, put, let's go through a few things. Number one, have you read in the Lord's Prayer where it says, lead us not into temptation? Have you read that? What's that, lead us not into temptation? Don't go where the temptation is. When I was in college, there was one place on the college campus I found after a while I just had to stay away from, and that was the bakery. Because the odors coming out of that place were so appealing that I would walk in there, buy a dozen donuts, and I would have them all eaten before I got to my room. So I just had to stay away from... You have to, as much as possible, stay away from temptation. But you know what? Sometimes there's temptations in this world and you can't fly out of the world to get out of temptation. So there's temptations around you. You can't totally escape it. So what do you do then? You know what Jesus said to His disciples in Gethsemane? He said, watch and pray so that you do not enter into temptation. If you're looking to the cross and you're thinking to yourself, Lord, what? I need to be changed. How can I be changed? You're going to start to pray. You're going to start to watch and pray. You're going to try to keep yourself away from temptation, but you're still going to have temptation, and you're going to have to pray that the Lord will give you grace to overcome the temptation. Could Jesus keep Peter from falling into temptation that night? No, Jesus could not keep Peter from falling into temptation. I say that respectfully. But Peter had to be subjected, had to have the opportunity to be tempted that night. That, he could not be kept from temptation. But could he have been kept from yielding to the temptation? Yes, he could have, but if he had watched and prayed instead of sleeping that night, he could have been kept from yielding to the temptation. So, work out your own salvation. It's God, actually, that works in you. When you're praying and you're in temptation, the Lord will bring to you divine power so that you can stop and say, no, I'm not going to eat until mealtime. That's number one. That's... That's a first result of looking to Jesus is that every character deficiency can be supplied. Do you want every character deficiency to be supplied? It can be if you keep looking to Jesus. Here's the second thing that happened when you look to Jesus. Every defilement can be cleansed. Now the Bible talks a lot about that. Look in your Bible in 1 John 1. It's interesting the way the context in which the Apostle John writes this verse. 1 John 1, 7. He's talking about the person who's looking to Christ. You can read that in the first six verses. He says that we've seen Him. And we're talk, telling you about Him so that you can have fellowship with Him too. And... He says in verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. Now I need to tell you something that's a little bit sad, but we need to think about it. In the church today, in the Adventist churches today, as I travel around, I find that there is not a lot of fellowship 
I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it is in the United States. It's not that way in all foreign countries. In the United States, there's a lot of churches where there's not very much fellowship. What's the reason? What's the problem? It said, and here's the problem right here. It says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. How can I explain it simply? If people in the church are looking to Christ, they're looking to Him always, they're being changed into His image. As the people in the church are changed into the image of Christ, do you know what will happen when you're around them? You're going to have fellowship because L. White says in the book Ministry Healing, page 18, I, I hope, I want to, I've been wanting to preach a sermon on this for a long time. <laughs> page 18, she says concerning Jesus that it was heaven to be in His presence. Why did people want to be around Him? Because it was heaven to be in His presence. Well, if I am looking to Christ, if I keep looking to Christ, what's going to happen is I'm changed in His image. What will happen? It will become heaven to be in my presence. Now, let's think this through. If everybody in the church is doing this, if everybody's looking to Christ and they're being changed into His image, what is going to happen? It's going to be heaven to be in the presence of these people. My friends, when Jesus comes, our character is not going to be changed. This has application, of course, in the home. We have many homes today. 50% or more marriages today end in divorce. Why? Because Ellen White says there are many costly homes and it's like hell inside. She says that. It's like hell inside. But she says, our homes should be like a little heaven to go to heaven in. So we need to ask ourselves the question, is my home more like heaven or more like hell? Which is it? And whichever it is, what am I doing about it? Am I making my home more like heaven or more like hell? What am I doing? Every defilement can be cleansed if we look to Jesus. Number three, here's a third thing that can happen if we keep looking to Jesus. Every fault can be corrected. Isn't that wonderful? I knew a young lady one time and she had a very unfortunate background. She wasn't living with her parents. She was li first living here and there. And you know, when young people don't have a stable home background, I never had that problem. I was very, very privileged. I lived with my father and my mother until I got old enough to leave home and established a home of my own. I never had that experience. But this girl had a very unfortunate upbringing. She didn't have any either parent to live with, didn't even... We got a lot of one-parent homes, but this girl didn't even have one parent to live with. She was living with this, per this home, that home, the other. And she developed a, a bad habit, a fault. And her fault was, it just seemed like she could not resist stealing, especially money. Wherever, whatever home she was in, you, you, you did not leave any money anywhere. It would disappear. It just seemed that she could not overcome that. But you know what? If a person looks to Jesus and they ask for divine help, I can't come to the Lord in the day of judgment and say, Lord, my parents got a divorce. My father died when I was young. My mother left home when I was young. I had this terrible thing happen and therefore this. No. You can't come to the Lord in the day of judgment and say, Lord, I, I, I was so poor I developed this habit of stealing. I, I, you can't do that. If you're going to be in heaven, you have to have a perfect character. And you can have a perfect character no matter how bad your background is if you look to Jesus. Because if you look to Him, 
He can give you the power to overcome every fault. He has promised to do that. And then a fourth thing that's just wonderful to think about. All of these in the book, Education, page 257. Every excellence could be developed. Now, every child, every young person has some weak points and some excellent points. And the excellent points can be even more developed through Christ. How much can they be developed? Well, look what it says here in Colossians. Colossians 2, verse 10. It says, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principalities and powers. Let's summarize what we've been talking about. To look means that you put your trust in who you're looking at. If you look to Him, you put your trust in Him. If you trust Him, you're going to start talking to Him. <laughs> and He's going to listen. You're going to ta start talking to Him about what you're working on in your life. There's a song. I, I like a song. I've, I've never heard it in the Adventist church. It's a, I've heard other Protestants sing it. I hope we can have it in our church sometime. And the song is called Working on the Building. I love that song. We're all working on a building. What building are we building? We're building a building of character. And day by day, we're to look to Jesus and be working on the building so that every excellence can be developed, every deficiency supplied, every fault corrected, everything that's defiled be cleansed. And this is possible. Another one of my favorite songs is the song, Only Believe. And that comes right straight out of the words of Jesus. Look in your Bible in Mark 11, first of all. Mark 11. I want to read these words in closing because I don't want anybody to go out of here and have even the faintest idea that this can't happen. Because look at what Jesus says. It can happen in your life. And it will happen in your life. You just follow directions. not complicated. Mark 11 24. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. That's Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Here's Mark 9, 23 and 24. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now that's a very interesting text because this father was struggling with unbelief and but he chose to believe. Ellen White makes a very interesting statement about that text. She says, if you say that, if you say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. She says, you can never perish. He has the power to give you what you need if you can believe. Oh, there's a lot of people that can't believe. <sighs> my parents are Irish. I'll never overcome my impatient, evil temper. Well, if you don't believe you can, you never will. You'll be lost. But Jesus said, if you can believe, it can happen. If you keep looking at Him, you say, Lord, I believe. I'm struggling with unbelief, but I'm choosing to believe. I'm choosing to believe that through you, every deficiency in my character can be supplied. I'm trusting that every defilement inside of me can be cleansed. I'm trusting that every fault in my character can be overcome. I'm trusting that every excellence can be developed. You have promised. Do you realize, friends, when God promises something, his, the, his entire government would be destroyed if He didn't come through with His Word, if you fulfill the conditions? Have you ever thought about that? When God promises something, He stands behind every promise that He's made. And if there could anybody come to the Day of Judgment and say, Lord, I, I've, I followed the directions. I did what you said to do. I followed the directions and now I'm lost. If somebody could actually say that, it would topple the government of God. But nobody will be able to say that in the Day of Judgment. Nobody will be able to say, well, Lord, 
I, I followed the directions. I did what you said to do. And now I'm lost. Nobody will be able to say that. Jesus said, if you can believe. How, much th how many things are possible if you can believe? All things. Don't tell the Lord, friend, well, I, I can't overcome my evil appetite. I can't overcome my impatience. I can't overcome my lust. I can't, over I can't control my thoughts. I can't do this. I can't. Don't tell the Lord that. The Lord says, he said to this man, his son was possessed of a devil. And he says, if you can do anything, please help. The Lord said, listen, it's not whether I can do it. It's whether you can believe. If you can believe, everything's possible to the one that believes. Whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you will have them, and you will have them. Now, of course, like all other promises in the Bible, that promise has conditions. Ellen White says, in commenting on that, she says, Our request must be according to God's will. You know that from Matthew 26. Jesus said, Not my will, but your will. Our request has to be for things that God has promised. And God has made many promises in His Word. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. That's God's will. If you pray for sanctification, for living holiness, He's going to fulfill it. He's going to make it happen in your life. And whatever we receive must be used in doing God's will. You remember the text in James 4.3 that James strode to those people? He says, you're asking and you're not receiving because you're asking amiss so that you might consume it on your own pleasures. But God has promised some things. I want to close by reading some things that God has promised that you can claim and you can have. Number one, God has promised that if you ask and confess, He will forgive your sins. He's promised that in 1 John 1, 9. Number two, God has promised that if you ask, now promised to everybody, but if you ask, He will give to you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will bring to you every other blessing you need. That's Luke eleven thirteen. God has promised that you can have a Christ-like temper. You can read that in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23. God has promised to give you strength and wisdom to do His work. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 4 and James 1. If you ask for the things that God has promised, you will receive. We have just a few seconds left, and I want to read to you quickly, in closing, a prayer. This is an old Bible. This is a Bible that my father had with him in the military service in World War II. And he wrote this. He wrote this. This is a manuscript Ellen White wrote in 1908. And this is what he wrote, my dad wrote in the flyleaf of his Bible. I want to read this to you and then we'll be done. This is what it says. The prayer that does not succeed in modulating our wishes, in changing the passionate desire into still submission, the anxious tumultuous expectation into quiet surrender is no true prayer. The life is most holy in which there is the least of petition and desire and the most of waiting upon God that in which petition often passes into thanksgiving. Pray till prayer makes you forget your own wishes and leaves or is merged into God's will. The divine wisdom has given us prayer not as a means to obtain the good things of earth, but as a means whereby we learn to do without them, not as a means to escape evil, but as a means whereby we become strong, to meet it. May you have that strength. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth.